partisan culture. Um, and it speaks to things that go on right now that speak to historical um, historical references and then also tell the tale of the future. Um, and this conversation is definitely gonna to speak to a lot of things going on right now. Looking forward to bringing the panelists forward so we can just go ahead and jump into it. Um, if we could start with uh, an introduction to your name, uh, what your organization or affiliation is and how you're doing today. And I'll start with you, uh, Supervisor Wilma Chan. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm Supervisor Wilma Chan. I represent um, Oakland, Alameda, San Leandro, San Lorenzo um, on the Board of Supervisors. And I'm doing really well this evening. Thank you for inviting me to this great panel. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Patty Enrado. Uh, please introduce yourself. Great. Thank you, Penn. And hi, everyone. My name is Patty Enrado. I'm a Filipino American novelist, and my historical novel, A Village in the Fields, is about the contributions of Filipino Americans to the farm labor movement in California. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Up next, Danny Thongsi, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Thongsi. I'm with the uh, Justice Re uh, Reinvestment Coalition of Alameda County, the campaign co coordinator. So the, uh, the JRC, uh, we're uh, comprised of 19 community-based organizations committed to creating a, uh, a fair and just uh, public safety system based on effective practices that invest in our community and our families and also our people. So um, yeah, I'm feeling excited. Thank you, thank you for being here. Nicole, Nicole Kwan, uh, last but not least, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole, an Oakland High sophomore. I will be here representing our Asian youth in Oakland here today and I'm very glad to be here with you all and I'm feeling excited to be in the panel. Thank you, thank you all. I think it'd be great to just start with a little bit of a introduction, a deeper introduction into who you are and the work you all do. I wanna go backwards, um, starting with Nicole first. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What grade are you in and what are you looking to study in school? So I am a sophomore at Oakland High, 10th grade, and we're, I'm just studying STEM. I'm really interested in being a leader for my school and representing Oakland and the Bay Area. And Thank you for that. Best of luck. STEM is not an easy lift at all. Uh, Danny, uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that you, that you do with your organization. Yeah, thanks, Vendoros. Uh, so yeah. Um, I'm um, a community organizer with the Justice Reinvestment uh, Coalition of Alameda County. So uh, mainly what I do as a campaign coordinator is that I make sure that, uh, you know, communication itself between uh, organization are really effective. And I also help, uh, you know, organize uh, with the community and do community outreach and so forth. And I'm also, um, you know, a formerly incarcerated um, uh, leader as well. So yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just grateful just to be here with you guys. Thank you for being here and juggling a lot. It, uh, hats off to you for that. Uh, Patty, could you please tell us a little bit more about uh, your work and also um, some of your uh, writing, some of your published work? Sure. Um, you know, growing up, there weren't that many role models for me uh, as a Filipino American. I'm um, growing up in, uh, you know, the Central Valley in California. I'm happy to say that there are a lot more Filipino American writers that are writing out there. So happy to see that sort of evolution and blossoming and happy to be a part of that group. Thank you for that. We'll dive into some of the work that you've published because it definitely speaks to why we're here today. Um, Supervisor Chen, can you just tell us about the work that you do in the day to day? Okay, I'm one of five members on the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. We're a regional government, but Alameda County has 14 cities and unincorporated areas. And we make many, many of the decisions that affect people's lives in terms of public safety, health care, and social services. And um, in I also wear, I wear a lot of hats and one of them, I've been an activist in the Asian American community for over 50 years. That is bringing a lot to the table and it's definitely <laughs> a resource we pull upon today. I wanted to follow up with you, Supervisor Chan, on the note of public safety. I believe that's what's bringing us here today. Uh, there's been uh, just a long list of horrible incidents that have impacted people clear across the board, a number of which have targeted uh, people of the Asian community. And I wanted to uh, ask you, it's a question that um, we're gonna ask all panelists, but you specifically, uh, what are our elected officials doing right now about the situation at hand? Well, there's a lot going on, um, which can give people hope. Um, there has been a 169% increase in anti-Asian violence just in the first quarter of this year. 
Um, at the federal level, um, the Senate uh, recently passed S-937 um, with only one person voting against it. This is one of the uh, first bipartisan efforts in many, many, many years. And that establishes a position in the Justice Department um, to speed up um, hate crimes and also to give grants to law enforcement agencies. At the state level, um, our new Attorney General, um, Rob Bonta, the first um, uh, Filipino American to serve in the state assembly, I used to be an assembly member myself uh, years back, um, is also going to form some type of committee at the state level. And locally, uh, we've passed a resolution um, condemning anti-Asian violence at the Board of Supervisors and are working with many of the cities who are doing the same, as well as giving, um, having our Sheriff's Department give some aid to the Oakland Chinatown community, which has been particularly hard hit um, with elder residents being pushed to the ground and um, you know they were just walking around. So we do things on the ground, we do things policy-wise, and we work with our state and federal partners to make sure that this issue is at, at the forefront um, because it's so important. Thank you for that. Just a bit of a follow-up. Um, I was recently listening to a podcast by The Bay from KQED and they the subject matter was about um, identifying hate crimes. How do you identify something as a hate crime? And I'm wondering from, uh, as, uh, from the elected perspective, how do you identify something as a hate crime? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but I understand it's very hard to identify something legally as a hate crime because you have to prove the motivation. And I think one thing that's taking place at the federal and state level is to try to make the def definition a little bit less onerous on the person um, who uh, is the victim of the crime. I mean, a hate crime to me is, it's actually quite obvious when a person is um, harassed, uh, beaten, um, denigrated based on their, on their race. So based solely on their race. Thank you for that. Um, switching now to Patty, for the historical perspective, um, people understanding that this is not a new phenomenon, anti-Asian violence <laughs> in California. Uh, could you bring me into some of the um, historical references that, that bring this to the surface? Sure, and I can speak from, you know, from the Filipino perspective. Uh, so in the turn of the century, um, a lot of labor contractors, you know, went to the Philippines to recruit uh, labor workers to come to Hawaii and also to <clears throat> California and a lot of the other states to, to work on farms. And um, <clears throat> there were a lot of, uh, you know, anti-Filipino, um, uh, you know, riots that happened. Um, a lot of times the men will go to dance halls to dance and um, the, they, the society didn't want to see Filipino men dancing with white women. So a lot of riots were, um, you know, happened because of that. So there was a lot of tension there, uh, you know, between, um, you know, against Filipinos. Uh, there were riots, there were, um, there were also strikes that happened because they weren't treated very well uh, in terms of pay, in terms of um, uh, working conditions. So um, there was a lot of animosity uh, against the Filipinos, um, even though they were, you know, uh, contracted to come, you know, here to work in the in the farms. It's a bit ironic. I mean, and specifically in a place like Stockton, where you have um, a number of working class individuals from different backgrounds. How did those working class individuals learn to coexist? <clears throat> you know, that's a kind of a. Uh, uh, I think that the. I don't know that they really did, honestly. Um, there was a building in Stockton that was bombed, uh, you know, in Watsonville, um, I think it was in 1932. There was a five day riot, you know, that happened where uh, a Filipino farm worker um, ended up being killed. And he was, uh, the people who were responsible for it were brought to trial and, you know, they were let go. So <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, activities that happened that did not, uh, you know, where justice was not served. And I think that that has happened, you know, throughout the decades, you know, leading up to, um, and you can even go to Vincent uh, Chan's, uh, you know, murder that, or Vincent Chen, I'm sorry, murder that happened in, you know, in, in the early uh, 80s where um, Japanese, uh, during the auto, in the auto industry, um, a lot of Japanese manufacturers were, you know, their cars were coming into the U.S. Um, and um, Vincent, uh, Chin, who was not Japanese, was targeted by uh, some auto workers and um, blaming, you know, blaming him 
uh, blaming the you know Japanese for um, the auto workers in Detroit you know losing you know losing their jobs and um, so uh, once again the two people who were responsible for his death um, you know didn't uh, didn't uh, justice was not served you know in that case so again you know we have just have this history of these of, of these things happening and not just you know justice not being served so there's sort of a, a history of that happening and uh, you know today thinking that well it you know, nothing happened back then, um, you know, it could still happen today and not, you know, be responsible for the violence that's happening. Lack of accountability or right. repercussion, understood. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of which, uh, Danny, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, when we talk about justice, um, coming from a system informed perspective, what does justice look like when you have incidents, incidents like this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, you know, justice is something that, um, for one thing that, uh, you know, we cannot uh, conflate police and incarceration with justice or public safety, as, as we see that um, the harm that uh, has been caused by law enforcement within itself, you know, especially within a community of colors, uh, uh, black and brown community, you know, we, we, we know that, uh, you know, certain laws uh, back in, you know, the 70s and the 80s uh, that uh, were used to uh, criminalize a lot of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, minority, um, you know, community members. And, and, and as far as myself, you know, I mean, I myself have also, you know, uh, been criminalized at such a young age as well, just for trying to uh, seek protection from, uh, you know, group of people, then afterwards, you know, and, 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 and ended up uh, being incarcerated. As I see that, uh, you know, we do not want, um, you know, our community to continue to, uh, you know, suffer that trauma, because we know that, uh, you know, incarceration or uh, Punitive justice is not the solution, uh, you know, for it. So, if not punitive justice, is there an example of something that can be the resolution? I think I think what it is that we have to, uh, you know, get to the root cause of things, you know, which is uh, the systemic issue. And one, you know, could be uh, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, white supremacy within itself, you know, which is used to, uh, you know, pin community of colors against each other. Just like, for example. Uh, the term, the model minority myth, which was coined back in the 60s uh, by, uh, you know, sociologists. And we know that, uh, you know, back in the 60s, that's when the civil rights movement uh, was happening. And yet we have this uh, white uh, sociologist wrote, wrote this article, you know, using an example of um, a Japanese uh, professionals, you know, who, who were able to overturn their uh, experience of being in the internment camp to be successful, right? But without really, uh, you know, uh, analyzing the entire data of the collective of, uh, you know, uh, Asian community within itself, right? As, as, as we see that, you know, this model minority myth uh, within itself does not serve the Asian community in injustice. Getting back to the root of the problem and, and looking at the broader perspective, that is definitely something that uh, it's going to take a lot of education, a lot of conversation, and this is why why we're here today, you know, to keep this conversation going. So thank you, thank you all so far. And uh, speaking of education, Nicole, bring you into the conversation now. What's it like being in high school with all of this going on? You know, being an Asian American in high school right now, we are definitely facing microaggressions. You know. Um, we understand that like everybody isn't completely educated on, you know, these social movements that are happening, like these things, these stereotypes that we've been taught since birth, like, as Danny said, we need to get to the root of the problem, which is like just stereotypes that we've all been taught since birth, like we've grown up with these ideologies and mindsets that certain races are caused like by certain people. Um, just dealing with uh, a lot of microaggressions, as I said before, like, um, honestly, being in Oakland, we are a pretty diverse community. I feel like I haven't faced as much racism or uh, aggression as I would have in more highly white populated areas. So that's how I'm feeling right now. Uh, I do support my community. I understand that not everyone has the same 
ideas as I ha could as a student. But as Danny said, we should work on it as a community, face the root of the problems, and have a lot of conversations as we are having today. Thank you for that, Nicole. I, um, I spent a lot of time in my childhood around the Oakland High area. And yeah, my community was real diverse, you know, people of all backgrounds. And I never really thought to myself that I'm just a member of this one specific racial group community. Uh, yes, I identify as African American, but I live in a community, again, that's, you know, really diverse. And so I'm wondering, do you ever feel just like you are just a part of a segmented community versus a part of a full, you know, picture of, of diversity? I, as I said again, growing up in Oakland, I feel like I've gotten along really well with everybody of every community, you know, whether it's Latinx, white, African-American. Uh, though, honestly, since the pandemic, I haven't been able to, you know, go out and meet new people. I do want to fight with them against these, uh, against things that are racially happening against their communities. You know, I want to be there for them, but it's definitely difficult being, like apart from everyone else right now since because of the pandemic in general. But as an Asian American, I do wish that I've gotten the chance to like spread out more and just be able to learn about these cultures, learn about their struggles, their the the things that are racially impacting them in their communities as well. Thank you for that. That's exactly what like I wanted to get to it. It speaks to like origins of issues or like what's at the heart of it is this overlapping oppression that uh, people of all of many backgrounds face. And this is a, a question clear across the board. Um, I'm just wondering how can we highlight overlapping systems of oppression so that groups of different backgrounds can work together to overcome? And I'll, I'll just throw it to the whole panel. Feel free to speak. Well. I'll say that as an elected official, I've never run in a district that was, uh, had one plurality, um, you know, not majority Asian, very mixed, very mixed districts. And I, I found in campaigning, I had the privilege of going door to door and speaking to a lot of people that at base, people want the same things. Um, they want to be healthy. They want their children to do well and um, be able to, um, do well in school and be gainfully employed. Um, you know, they want a, a great civic life. They want to be safe. And I think we need to emphasize um, the commonalities among people, which I always do uh, when I run, ran for office. And I think my other thought about it is um, there's always been more anti-immigrant and anti-Asian um, hate in times when um, the economy was bad and when there were uh, a lot of economic divisions. Well, you probably know income inequality is worse than it's ever been. I think uh, the top 1% controls something like 80% of the wealth of the country. And I think those of us who aren't in the top 1%, which is the majority of us, and those who are in the bottom 10% really face a lot of similar problems. Um, we don't have the basic things we need. And we need to work on those together and understand that distribution of wealth really affects how we're treated. I was going to say that that I think uh, one really important thing is, and it's a really simple thing, is just letting different communities know that you support them, you know, that you're there for them. Um, I remembered uh, last summer um, we put up a Black Lives Matter sign um, up on our second floor uh, window, so you could you know, often. Um, reached out to me and he said, um, and he's African-American, and he said, I drove by your house, I saw the sign. He said, I can't tell you just how meaningful that was to see that sign and to know, you know, that, you know, that you, I have your support. And I said, well, of course you have our support, um, you know, but it, it, it's one of those things that it's a simple thing, you know, this gesture of letting people know, or even just having a sign that, you know, that you support, you know, what's going on. So when, you know, friends say, um, I'm, you know, I've, I've been hearing and reading about all of these anti-Asian, you know, violent attacks that have been happening. I just want to want you to know, you know, I, I'm thinking about you, I have your back. And I think that just having that knowledge and having, you know, reaching out really means a lot. Thank you for that. 
Uh, Danny, Nicole, anything to add to a conversation around overlapping oppression? Yeah, definitely. I think that, uh, like, like you had mentioned before, you know, education is the key within itself. Like, like um, I feel like um, with, within the Asian community, um, especially in America, um, a lot of people don't really truly understand um, our API, you know, history or culture within itself. But when, when it comes to, uh, when you speak about Asian or API, people often lump Asian together, you know, without really um, seeing that um, in, in, uh, in the Asian community, there's diversity of, you know, I mean, just uh, languages, dialect, uh, and, and, you know, just different places that uh, uh, individual uh, had, uh, you know, uh, the, the origin from in, in, in Asia. And I, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the number one key thing is also, you know, of course, to uh, educate and education within itself, you know, learning about the API community and also the API community also learn about, you know, uh, other community as well. Like, for example, you know, when we truly understand, uh, you know, the API struggle, you know, we see that um, as far as as racism or scapegoating has been been uh, added, you know, on, on the API community since the beginning, as, 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 as we read in history, the first immigration law that was passed was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was to exclude one specific race within itself. Then afterwards, you know, we see that the Chinese, uh, I mean, the Japanese internment camp within itself, you know, targeting, um, you know, a specific gr uh, group and race of people, you know, putting them in, uh, in uh, internment camp in itself. And we also see that uh, even with the war in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the uh, America war in Vietnam, even with, with that war, when the influx of refugee that were uh, you know, trying to uh, get into the United States, at, at that time, the US did not really want to take responsibility or accept you know, refugee until uh, advocates start pushing them and also shaming them. That's when, you know, uh, they, they uh, signed a bill, passed a law to, uh, you know, uh, allow a refugee in. And also, if, you know, if we also uh, really understand, truly understand the civil rights movement, uh, African-American, you know, had really been fighting for, you know, equal rights for, for, for all of us, you know. And, and we know that, uh, you know, our, our API community and also other uh, ethnic minority community benefit from that as well. So, so I think that if we truly understand each other, you know, struggle, history, and culture, and we're uh, we're able to see that you know the struggle that we are fighting for are pretty much similar, you know, and basically all all this all this that we're fighting for is to combat it, you know. I just want to add that I feel like the way that these overlapping racial oppressions can come together and tear down racial barriers are definitely by education and it all starts with the youth right now like these second generation first generation Asian American or just any immigrants coming into the United States right now I feel like it's important for them to learn about these different races these different uh like signs of oppression that they're all going through it all starts with our youth and just spreading out the word that we should come together we should break down these racial barriers and uh, like understand that at the end of the day we're all humans we bleed the same blood we have no differences rather than the scientific you know dna that's in our blood we we won't fully understand like the way that we can come together and so we do come together and understand. Unity is key, thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to just go back to the list because there was a lot said and I wanna make sure that that is all heard. So like the economic understanding, acknowledgement, just something's very simple. Um, civil rights amongst other things and understanding history and then education key in coming together and creating unity. Um, it sounds like a recipe for success. And I know it's not as simple as that. You know, there's a lot more nuanced and uh, there's a lot of people dealing with scars um, around uh, interaction between people of different backgrounds, not just race, but also class, religion, you name it. Um, and so if the goal is unity, I just wanted to start laying out some of the elements that we need in order to actually create that. Is there anything else to add before I move on to the next question? Uh, 
Yeah, I, you know, one thing that Nicole had said about, um, you know, education and everyone talked about education is the importance of ethnic studies, um, you know, to have that in California. And, and I know in different school districts, um, you know, they're having ethnic studies either as a requirement to graduate from high school, you know, or offering it. Um, but there has been studies done at Stanford, um, and I think it was at Lowell High School in San Francisco, where um, the students were doing really well after they took an ethnic studies class. And I think that has a lot to do with empowerment, you know, uh, a sense of empowerment, sense of understanding where you came from, a sense of understanding your history, um, you know, in this country. And I think that, you know, that that also allows students to, uh, you know, to take hold of their education. So what, I think that's really important to be able to understand, um, you know, do people know, uh, you know, all of these acts that were, were passed, you know, the, um, you know, anti-Asian uh, acts that were passed through through the years by the government. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, the fight that a lot of groups had to, you know, go through to get those laws, you know, taken off. So um, I think, you know, it's important to understand everything that um, our, you know, ancestors went through, um, but also all of the activism that, uh, that they put into it to, um, you know, to be able to overcome that oppression is really important, I think, especially for, for the young kids. Thank I you think, for that. Yeah, I think the other point that uh, Nicole made um, that we should add to the list is really encouraging and empowering our young people to step up as the new leaders um, in this period of time. I, I, think, um, I think, Danny, someone mentioned that um, back when in the 60s, it really was young people who led those coalitions and to brought together the, um, I just remember I was, I was young once, uh, the African-American, uh, Asian, Puerto Rican, um, all the different communities and um, to work together and follow each other's models. Um, during that period of time, um, there were also divisions, but I think there was a lot of working together. And I think um, I participated in Jesse Jackson's campaigns in 1984 in 1988, and that was also a lot of young people coming together um, and working in the Rainbow Coalition, which I think was a great social movement um, that included all the ethnic minorities, as well as women, as well as um, gays. And um, I think that also was led by young people. And I see a lot of new leadership coming out from young people today, and we need to encourage them. They need to learn from people who have experience, but we have to uh, support their enthusiasm. Thank you for that. Um, we're looking at uh, just about 15 more minutes of panel discussion before we open it up to the Q&A with the audience. But there's a, a question at the heart of uh, why I'm here as an African-American man and talking to you all. And I'm wondering, um, Supervisor Wilma Chan, specifically for African-Americans who see legislation being passed in order to do something about the violence happening in the Asian community, how do you discuss that with uh, a community that's long been um, hurt by violence? Well, I think um, it, uh, someone mentioned that um, we have to support each other. Um, uh, the Asian American community, and particularly new immigrants who, who don't really know the history of this country, it's our job um, as elected officials, Asian elected officials and leaders to um, educate our own community about the history of African Americans in this country from slavery till now. And the other way, I think it's up to African-American leaders to educate their, their community about Asians. And particularly, I think um, this, Asia, this black on Asian crime that's been happening is really, um, it's not just Asian Americans. There's an anti-immigrant sentiment to it too. I think these were all brought up by the Trump, you know, uh, fanned up by the, by the Trump administration. So I think we, um, we have to be able to talk to each other. Um, yesterday, I was at the rally in Oakland, Chinatown with Keith Carson. Uh, he and myself have been doing a lot of this work and he talked about, we don't want black on black violence. We don't want black on Asian violence. We don't want Asian on Asian violence, black on Latino violence. Um, we have to um, combat some of the misinformation that people have been getting and let people know that, hey, things aren't too good for a lot of our folks and we, we can do better by working together. Just a quick follow-up. How do you combat that with framing such as though uh, in the media, oftentimes you see framing that doesn't support combating it. I'll just say that. 
Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, <laughs> you know, if it were easy, we would have done it already. And, and a lot of the, these things um, wouldn't exist. I think we just have to take every opportunity to, um, well, young people, sh again, should take the lead, I think, to have forums, to have discussions, um, to um, continue to have um, ethnic studies in, in, um, in universities so people could, and, and, and encourage people like uh, Asians to take Black studies, uh, African Americans to take Asian studies. And um, I don't have the magic bullet. You know, I wish I, I, wish I did. But we are um, very good at getting pit against each other. And it really does nobody, none of us, any, any good. I hope I can chime in. Um, you know, my novel deals with the Delano grape strike that happened in 1965. And, you know, leading up to that, uh, it was either, you know, Filipino uh, farm workers or uh, Mexican and Mexican American farm workers who would break each other's strike. So, you know, one group would go on strike and then the other group would scab, you know, and, and break the strike. So the growers were always successful in getting what they wanted. And it wasn't until um, 1965 when Larry Edleong, who's a Filipino American labor leader, um, was gonna strike. And he went to Cesar Chavez, who was also, uh, had his own labor uh, organization. And he said, let's work together you know, let's work together because otherwise we're just gonna keep scabbing each other. And, and that's really what made that strike last um, was the ability for Cesar Chavez's group and Larry Itleong's group to come together and to say, we're gonna, you know, fight the growers together. And, you know, even previous to that, um, you know, the growers had a lot of camps and a lot of different migrant workers stayed in those camps. So, um, you know, had you had uh, the poor whites from who came from Oklahoma and um, Arkansas. Um, you had Puerto Ricans. You had uh, Yemen Yemeni um, immigrants, um, and they all stayed. You had the Braceros, who were um, you know workers from Mexico, uh, and then you had the Mexicans and the Mexican Americans who were uh, in California. So they all stayed in these camps, and it was the foreman's job to sort of separate them. So they were separated by camps. They were separated by dining halls and in the work fields. And so they would keep them separated by telling each other, the foreman would say, you know, the Filipinos don't think, you know, you guys work hard enough. So there's a historical uh, uh, precedence for, you know, being that wedge in, in keeping these groups, um, you know, separated because, you know, when, when you're separated, it's a lot easier to control people, you know, groups of people when you can finally come together as one group, you know, you're much stronger and you have, you know, greater unity and power. Look at it, the examples you just laid out though, you said separation, like physical separation. You mentioned a lack of resources, misinformation, uh, just so many elements that pop up time and time again. Um, and this is a bit of me learning in public. Uh, this is where, uh, what, what was the name of the union that came out of it and the clap that was cut into it? Right, so the United Farm Workers, you know, it became, you know, those two groups, um, you know, came together. Um, you know, uh, it, it didn't turn out actually well for the Filipino Americans because um, it, it, there began divisions, you know, once the UFW was formed, there were some divisions. So the Filipinos became the minority within the minority and they ended up, you know, you know ex exiting from the UFW. Um, but, uh, you know, in the beginning anyway, it was, it was a great start to, you know, in, in that uh, theme of unity. An example, an example is, uh, it's a blueprint and then it's not always, you know, like you said, the silver bullet or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, divisions, Danny, I wanna bring you into the conversation in terms of uh, your experience while incarcerated, because I know that um, while incarceration is a hell of an example of what's going on in America. And I just wanted to ask about um, the divisions that you saw there and any ways that in which you saw people navigating them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, like I had mentioned uh, to you guys before, um, you know, uh, just a saying that in order to understand uh, a country of, of the way, you know, it treats its people, uh, you would go to the place which would, uh, you know, would be like the lowest of place. So what I would say is that, uh, you know, if you go to America's prison, you know, you see the division of race, of segregation and so forth, right? And if you really want to want to truly understand, uh, you know, I mean, um, as far as separation of race, you go to America's prison in itself. I mean, 
the um, the way the way it's set up is designed. You know, it's pretty much to pit us against each other. And even even um, you know, if officers or so forth, right, administration try to change the rule on like allowing people to uh, uh, house with each other, a different race. But as far as the, the systemic um, separation of segregation has been embedded in that culture, you know. And what's interesting about that is that um, as, as we know that, uh, you know, separation within itself, it, it, does, uh, it does us no good, you know, as, especially within our community. And uh, yeah, that's why that, um, you know, our education within itself is like the key, right? And I love that uh, what uh, uh, Supervisor Chan had mentioned about ethnic study, uh, because I myself did not uh, learn ethnic study until after I got incarcerated. Uh, when, when I utilized the time to really start, you know, reading about history, history about um, slavery, his, history about indigenous people, history about Latin America, uh, history about uh, the, our API community, even my own Southeast Asian history, you know, and 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 then uh, there was an there was a group that was formed inside of San Quentin called uh, the Roots, which which is called uh, Restoring Our Original True Self. Um, that was a uh, uh, formed with uh, volunteers from the community, and uh, and a professor from Laney College, you know, who taught ethnic study. Also, I taught that group as well. So that's when I, re I really learned about, you know, my Southeast Asian history and also, you know, became empowered with it and started learning about uh, our other API, you know, history as well. And even more so of, uh, you know, the systemic oppression and, and, and even, um, you know, the true history of indigenous people and, and African-American folks. And that's when I start uh, understanding the overlap in place upon, you know, all of us, you know, especially people of, people of color, and, and 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 that's when you know I I started truly became enlightened, and and, and really you know I, I I think that's what really pushed me to, uh, you know, to do the work that I do in uh, you know uh, my community organizing work and start building uh, solidarity and allyship with with with, with other takes a little education turn that light on yeah thank you and thank you for your work too as well um as danny and i have met in other walks of life i've interviewed him for an article before and so i'm familiar with your work um nicole this is a question that's in the q a um and i think this is a, a time we can just start turning to that and i want to ask you first um the question is where is each panelist finding moments of hope and i'll start with you nicole so the way I'm finding hope right now, I am on social media. I have been seeing, you know, everything that other youth have been saying, you know, all across the world. I am finding hope in us in POC unity for the future because I feel like there has never been like such a moving moment in our history right now. I feel like youth have so much power right now through the uses of social media, through just spreading their voice. I feel like youth have never been as empowered as they are now with the strength that they have through social media. Like, um, as everyone was saying earlier, I did want to say something about that. Like, um, how can we avoid this um, POC, you know, uh, ideal that, black and Asian crime against each other, black and, yeah, Asian and black crime. Like, I feel like there's just so much generalization that is like the product of white supremacy since, you know, that has been going on forever. I feel like there's a lot of generalization, definitely misinformation in e any of the communities, racial, racial, like these like ideas that have been just taught to us were, the forms of products from white supremacy we just definitely need to take the time to you know not really look at these history books that american schools have provided for us but rather like the history that we can learn by ourselves through like the history of our culture in america from asian american immigrants and such and yeah that's like 
what the hope I'm feeling right now. Like I am very hopeful for our future. I believe in our future through like the peers around me now. And I have, I'm expecting a lot for everyone in America. I'm hoping that it'll definitely be a safer place for all POC, all minorities. Thank you for that. Those two, two threads that are definitely intertwined. When you talk about social media, one of the things I really appreciate about social media is that you get a sense of who that person is. You get a sense of who that individual is and you get past that generalization that you talk about. Um, and this isn't learning from a 300 page textbook. I'm learning from a social media account that I'm following and somebody who I can connect with, even if they're on the other side of the world. So I wanted to ask Nicole, is there a specific platform or a hashtag or an organization that you follow that you're really getting a lot of light from? On Instagram, there are a lot of Asian American um, uh, profiles that just uh, shed light on the things that have been happening lately in the AAPI community, but also like even movements like Black Lives Matter and, you know, specifically um, demographed like um, profiles that share light on everything that's been happening, you know, um, TikTok, Instagram are such powerful and useful platforms to share information, to share videos that of like Asian Americans getting attacked or, you know, things that could have saved people's lives if um, had been posted sooner, you know, like a lot of incidents weren't really reported or found out about until it was spreaded on social media. Like the use of social media has just saved a lot of people and brought them just justice. So definitely TikTok, Instagram, Facebook even. Yeah, and I, I mean, and again, again, no silver bullet, you know, social media, there's a lot of hate on social media as well. And so it's a matter of uh, choosing how to navigate it and, and being mindful, I guess, critical thinking is what I'm thinking of. Um, but yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, ask that question now to the rest of the room. Um, where are people finding glimmers of hope? And I'll start with Supervisor Chan. Well, it's um, with people, uh, with the young folks, I think for me, because I've been, um, I've been doing this work for a really long time. And when I see a new generation rising who has good values, um, in terms of bringing people together and speaking up, you know, you don't, you, if, if you don't speak up, nothing's going to happen. Um, and I see that happening. I mean, I grew up in a time when, um, you know, Chinese immigrants were being arrested and deported by, the, by uh, Joe McCarthy um, during the Korean War. And I've lived through personal racism and I lived through, uh, I think someone mentioned the Vietnam War. Um, I, uh, Asian Americans and uh, GIs, uh, Asian GIs had a very bad time <laughs> during that period of time and were targeted. And I think we have a lot of history. Um, the other thing that gives me hope is that we have resisted and there has been victories, um, such as the um, reparations paid to Japanese Americans, which was a 10 year movement. Um, and so I, I think the fact that also the response this time was very quick. Usually it takes a long, long time for people to come together. But these incidents have been happening since, uh, I mean, they've always been happening, but the escalation has been during the COVID pandemic, but certainly in the last six months, really, really escalated um, a lot in terms of um, people being really badly hurt. And But look at how fast people have responded. I think that's absolutely amazing. And that gives me a lot of hope. And like I said, the young people for sure. Action, yes. And I mean, there's nothing like seeing results and, and change in real time. So totally understood. Uh, Patty. Uh, Glimmers of hope. I'm going to sound like I'm going to sound like a broken record. Um, I have an almost 21 year old and an 18 year old, and um, you know, amazed. And I think social media has a lot to do with their uh, political awareness. Um, I was not politically aware until I went away to college. Uh, you know, where you kind of have that, uh, you know, in front of you. So it's really um, heartwarming for me to see the kids and you know their friends really know what's going on in this country. Really know, you know. What's happening? You know, they're on social media, um, but they're they're outraged, and you know, they want to do something about it. Uh, so, you know, it goes back to being seeing the young people, you know, taking charge. We've left them with a lot of things to to have to deal with, you know, just from climate change to you know to, to these issues that we're talking about today. 
but um, that does give me a lot of hope that you know they're they're learning really young, um, and again, it, social media has a lot to do with it. Um, being more politically aware, being most you know more aware of socioeconomic you know differences and um, inequalities, and you know being outraged by that. So I always think you know we may have some of these things happening uh, you know in in Washington D.C., but you know the um, feet on the ground. Um, I see a lot of you know my kids and and their friends. And I take, you know, uh, a lot of hope that um, that they'll carry that carry that on and be the activists that that uh, Supervisor Chan and Nicole were talking about being as well. It's like a informed optimism. <laughs> you bring up, you know, global warming and all the everything that the next generation is going to have to face, but knowing that they are ahead of the ball. And so, I, yeah, I definitely support that. Dan Danny, how about you? Where are you finding glimmers of hope now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in, in my organizing space, it has to be organizing with each other, you know, and of course, you know, I want to pay homage to the OGs. I mean, uh, you guys have, uh, you know, really laid the groundwork for us. <laughs> so, but yeah, because a lot of our uh, organizing ideas and, you, you know, uh, strategies, uh, we, you know, we get from you guys as well. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, definitely, like, you know, just organizing together, like, for example, when, um, you know, with the police uh, brutality, um, showing up in the space for Black Lives Matters, and and also you know even with 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 uh, uh, rallies uh, to stop AAPI hate you know I see um, uh, blacks and Latino um, you know community members coming up showing up together you know yeah I think that uh, you know just just by us just organizing with each other just uh, elevating our voices like that and that's why you know I mean. Um, our stories yourself and also, um, you know, uh, people are really speaking out, you know, about, uh, about, you know, all this incident and also just pretty much like, you know, coming together, just healing together. I, I, I think that, you know, when we organize together, we're much stronger together. We briefly mentioned it, but it's something I firmly believe in is telling the story. It's like, yeah, and that does wonders for anybody in any position. So thank you for that. Um, this is a question for Supervisor Chan. Um, how do you make sure constituents in your district who don't speak English keep safe and get the resources they need? Where can they get this info? Well, almost, I mean, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, but um, our website has, has a lot of information translated into a number of languages. I mean, when the last election, I think we had to do 12, 13 languages, um, you know, just for the voters. But um, you can find a lot of um, translated information about um, social services, healthcare, um, public safety on our websites. And also um, when we have, we'd like to have more translation at our board of supervisors meetings. I think that's a, sh a shortcoming, but we're working on that. And when we have issues that particularly um, impact uh, communities that speak other languages, we do, we do have interpretation. And we allow people, um, you know, double the amount of time to speak um, because, you know, there's the interpreter and then there's the person speaking. Um, this is definitely, um, you know, a diverse <laughs> county. Um, about a third of the county is immigrants and Asian Americans are the fastest growing sector of our county. And we have a lot of Latinx um, participants as well. So language, understanding of language and culture is key to making gover government work right now. Thank you for that. And we'll, um, we'll have a slide at the end of this that will share more information about resources, as well as I'll, I'll mention a couple of organizations that I know that are doing work on the grounds right now. Um, but I wanted to uh, follow up with you, Supervisor Chen, actually, um, about the anti-Asian hate crime bills, the uh, bill that was recently passed in the Senate. Um, just further clarification and what it all entails. Okay, uh, this bill was introduced by the representative um, from Hawaii, uh, Macy Hirano. And um, they had to, you know, um, when you're in government, you have to sometimes make compromises. So she may not have gotten everything she wants, but only one person voted against it. And it was uh, Mr. Holling who, oh, well. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything else. Um, so it does a few things. So it, it, it establishes a position at the Justice Department um, to ex expedite prosecution of hate crimes. And it also gives grants to law enforcement agencies to um, increase um, 
uh, their presence um, in the community. And I know that that's somewhat controversial. Um, Danny talked about it, but, but I would say we have to strike the right balance. I think um, like our residents in Chinatown, for instance, want to have more um, law enforcement presence in the community walking around. Um, they don't have to be arresting people, but just their presence, just the fact that they're there walking around makes them feel safer. I understand the history of um, police and I support police reform. I have a son who, well, he's grown now, but um, when he was younger, he was um, stopped a lot of times um, by either private security or by police when he was with his friends and they weren't doing anything, you know, they're just walking around and it's like, what are you doing? Why are you here? You know, or are you about to do something? So I get that, I totally get that. Um, but I think this bill will um, provide um, the resources to be used by communities in a way that communities feel comfortable with um, to increase law enforcement. A, a bit of a follow-up, but really a question across the board is, um, how seriously are these reports being taken? Do you feel like it's being taken seriously enough? Um, and that's from the authorities perspective, the community's perspective, and I guess um, from your personal perspective. Well, I think it remains to be seen. You know, um, I think that there is more reporting now um, than there was. People are speaking up and reporting um, these um, these crimes, um, and um, they are working on this definition of of hate crimes, which I think is really critical, because if if you can't if you can't prove it, there's going to be very few pro, um, prosecutions and stuff. So I think people are taking it more seriously and speaking to um, uh, what was uh, what Nicole said. Um, I think because people can see these things on social media more, and also um, people uh, like the recent incident with Carl Chan in Chinatown, people take pictures. Um, I think they're they're going to be um, paid more attention to because the proof is right in front of your face. Um, it's like with the George Floyd. Um, I think without that video um, that that person took, maybe the result would have been different. But when the, the public as a whole can see this, I think the response has to be faster and has to be more um, on target with what the community wants. Thank you for that. Anybody else, anything to add to uh, the question of how seriously uh, these things are being taken? No? Okay, totally fine. Um, related, but uh, a bit of a, speaks to my profession. It's, it's something my interest is, it's um, art. And it's something we haven't discussed yet, but I'm wondering what role art plays in bringing community together and navigating issues such as this. Patty, I see you unmuted. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, when I think of art, I think of, of literature, um, you know, and I think that that um, literature, when you read, especially when you read books that about uh, groups, you know, that, that don't look like you uh, and, and, you know, like, you know, other Asian American writers, um, you know, you can develop a sense of empathy, you know, understanding going into their world and understanding what their lives are like, you know, what issues they're going through. Um, use um, Interior Chinatown, and it won the um, National Book Award this year. And um, it, it was a, an unbelievably fabulous book. Um, he talks about uh, the stereotypes, particularly of, of Chinese Americans, but I felt like he was really talking about all Asian Americans in this sort of sense of invisibility that Asian Americans uh, you know, go through. Like there have been a lot of um, you know, oppression and violence that's happened you know, through the decades, but um, still somehow you know, still invisible. Um, and I think he really brought that up and um, it was chosen, I think, uh, as a book to read um, in NPR's Now Read This. And it was interesting how some people, you know, you think they're in an NPR book club, um, that some people were saying, wow, I didn't know that there was more than one Chinatown in you know, the US. Um, and, and it was really eye-opening for me thinking, wow, really? <laughs> you know? um, that there are a lot of Chinatowns in a lot of you know, big cities uh, in the US. But you know, when you start reading these books and by you know, Filipino Americans, you know, 
um, uh, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, um, you know, Korean Americans, and and you get an understanding of their point of view, which hasn't been, you know, it's it's there's more now, obviously, in the last ten, you know, twenty years, but you know, you you, you learn uh, about other cultures, you 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 get the sense of empathy, and I think that's the really one important thing that art, you know, and you know, literature in particular, you know, gives us as a community. Telling the story and getting familiar with getting to know your neighbor. It, it totally makes sense. It totally does. Supervisor Chan, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think art is fabulous and really, really important um, to this issue and other issues. I mean, look at Angel Island. Um, we wouldn't know the history of Angel Island if people hadn't written all those poems on the walls. Um, so I think it's, it's telling the story, like you said, Penn, earlier, how to tell the story, how to educate people. And also, you know, look at all the songs and poems that young people write and how powerful they are um, on, on these issues. Um, we are, um, I live in Alameda and there, there's always a, a poetry uh, contest every year and people write really interesting poems and they're almost all about social justice or issues they faced um, personally that when people hear them, they're very powerful. And lastly, I'd say art is also very uplifting, um, you know? When you're feeling bad or you're feeling like you're not represented or you're feeling whatever, um, songs, paintings, books, poems, I think are just so important. And I think the proof of it is why are people vandalizing all these murals and stuff? Because they know they speak the truth and they know that they're very powerful symbols. Um, the thing that happened in, in uh, San Francisco Chinatown. And um, so I think art is a very, very powerful uh, tool to fight uh, racism. Watching murals, uh, murals is, are like the language of the people and if these walls could talk and all of that. And yes, it's something I like to monitor as well because it definitely is a, is it a thermometer? Yes, a thermometer of a temperature gauge of what's going on out there. And so, yes. Um, Danny or Nicole, anything to add in terms of the role that art can play in navigating the issues at hand? Yeah, I think definitely art itself is essential, you know, and um, it tells a story and also brings healing. You know, it's a form of expression where you know us as as human, you know, we can express what we're feeling and what we're thinking at the moment. Uh, just like for example, at the wake of the you know the George Floyd murder, we saw that uh, the emotion of uh, of our community, you know, were enraged, right? And um, you know, we see that. Uh, that people were really, you know, just expressing themselves. Then, um, then later on afterwards, like you know, I I had a I, I had an opportunity to go down to uh, Broadway. Um, I think um, within um, a couple weeks after, uh, you know, some of the march that had happened. And my when when I was walking, I, I saw all these mural. It was just like walking down the outside art gallery within itself, right? You know, I, to me, I, I took so many photos, right? Because I know that, you know, this right here is gonna be like history, you know? I mean, just like you say, you know, if, if the walls could talk. And and, and, and to me, I, I believe that, you know, I mean, it, it spoke to me, you know? And, and I also believe that it spoke to everyone that, you know, walked past or drove past that as well. And even, uh, you know, doing, um, uh, um, you know, the violence against uh, our, our, our API community, when I was walking down in in, in uh, Chinatown, I, I I saw you know artwork art piece with uh, Malcolm X and Yuri Kochiyama, and uh, and 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 you know so many uh, great leaders that that were uh, you know speaking about solidarity and unity within the uh, API and 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 blacks you know I mean community I, I I see that you know art itself I mean it it really speaks volume, it brings healing, it brings unity. It does so much, not, not only uh, in, in Merle, but in other ways as well, like singing and so forth. Thank you for that. And yes, I saw that open air art gallery as well. And like uh, Supervisor Chan said, it's uplifting, you know, and it's like, yeah, it serves a spiritual purpose as well. Nicole, um, for you, what, what role does art play in navigating the issues at hand? I feel like art is such a universal language for everyone for that all, people of every community would, can manage to understand, you know, like a picture speaks a thousand words and like there's just, they're so personal to the community in general. It just 
brings it definitely does bring the community together brings together unity and it just speaks so much about it does speak a lot of volume to our community and what we're all going through together and how we can all fight together to try to have a time where we will look back and just notice that wow this was really a part of history and i'm glad that we're fighting to make a change now it's a beautiful way to document what's happening yeah definitely um i have a question in the chat and this is a matter of like I like to say when the rubber hits the road you know when things get real um for instance we mentioned the power of documenting incidents of hate or just violence period and putting it on social media and how that creates a ripple effect that can lead to change. I'm wondering, as a panelist right now speaking to an audience, um, do you have any recommend recommendations on what to do when you might encounter uh, a violent incident that might be a hate crime? Um, you recommend in intervening in a hate crime? Well, I think um, you're going to put some resources up at the end of the, um, of the meeting, but I I was um, able to go to a training, um, uh, a virtual training by um, Asian Law Caucus and some other people on what you can do. And it was really great. So um, like I said, you're gonna put it up at the end, but I would really encourage everyone to, um, to look at that because it was very non-judgmental and it gave, it gave different ways that people could intervene and help um, from very active to you know, slightly, um, slightly less active depending on how the individual felt about their own safety and um you know just generally how they felt so it was stuff like um you know if you hear someone saying something some some people would want to directly intervene and confront the person who's making that that racist comment to the other person um but they said like for instance if you don't want to do that um and you want to stop it you can distract people by making some loud noise or something you know, or running past them, you can just stop it by distracting them. Um, they talked about um, taking pictures. Um, they talked about, um, you know, calling somebody, you know, you have your cell phone calling somebody. Um, they talked about, um, you know, the least, they said the least um, kind of invasive intervention would be at least if the, when the event is over to go talk to that person, the victim, make sure they're okay both either psychologically or physically. So yeah, I hope you definitely put that up at the end. It was really, really specific and really helpful. And like I said, depending on your circumstances, your age, how you feel, um, you know, maybe your sex, there are many different things that you can do. Great resources, alternatives to just running in and putting yourself in jeopardy as well. Um, thank you for that. Is there anything else, anyone would like to add any other panelists? Patty, go ahead. It's it, it's a hard because I think the first impulse and I remembered uh, years ago when I was living in San Francisco uh, was downtown and there were two homeless men fighting. Uh, one of them was down on the ground and we were at an intersection and I stepped out of the car and I yelled out at them and I think it just surprised them and they took off in different directions. Um, I mean, I felt like I was safe because I was behind, you know, I was had a door you know in front of me. Um, I, I think the impulse is to, and, and in my case, is to intervene. So if something had hap happens on BART, you know, for instance, um, I know that there have been incidents that, that were shown um, where someone was being uh, uh, verbally assaulted and um, no one did intervene. Um, and, and, and I feel like I, if I were probably in that BART car, I probably would have said something um, and not thinking about, you know, safety you know, for myself, but I think uh, Supervisor Chan mentioned, you know, making sure that the other person, the victim, you know, that they're okay, probably is the safest thing to do, you know, if you're in sort of this, you know, situation because you're putting that focus on, you know, the victim as opposed to, um, you know, the perpetrator. Thank you for that. Real life examples. And I mean, this is a, this is a reality that we're dealing with. And so if people are listening, uh, we would want them to walk away with things that they could implement if unfortunately they, they do encounter this type of situation. Um, there's a, a question in the chat that um, is near and dear to me. It, about a year ago, um, after the killing of George Floyd, there was a response from 
companies, uh, brands, you name it. Black Lives Matter, everything. It was a Black Lives Matter chapter on Netflix. And, you know, just Black Lives Matter became, it was on the NBA hardwood. You know, it was everywhere. And it felt a bit performative and I wrote about it. And it, it really bothered me because it felt like capitalism was winning again and no substantive, sub substantive change was gonna come about. And so the question in the chat is, do you feel any of the AP, AAPI support or conversation from companies, allies, et cetera, is performative? And how do we ensure the support is long lasting and not just a part of a media cycle? Well, you all probably know that um, some businesses, including some Asian businesses have collected about $250 million um, nationally to help uh, fight hate crime. And um, one part that I like about it is including uh, setting up a database, um, which I think will be very, very helpful. I guess I, I have a different take on it. I mean, I know why people, you know, why companies do it. Obviously it helps in a lot of ways um, when it becomes a social movement, a big social movement, national social movement, it will help their bottom line. But the fact that, that it's risen to that level, I think is a great thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, that never would have happened in the past before. So I think that the fact that they, they, they pay attention and um, they feel they have to do this, sincere or not sincere, I'm not questioning you know, their motives, um, I think is generally a good thing. And I think that um, with this Asian fund, we should just make sure that it's spent in you know, the way they said, which I think data is, is, a, good, um, is a good angle because we need more data on it. And in terms of them, keeping going, I think they're gonna keep going as long as um, the, the situation exists and we're very loud about it, you know? It's all about speaking up and that will keep people going. It may come to a situation where if people um, have anti-Asian policies or, you know, um, anti-African-American um, black policies, you know, there, there would be boycotts, right? Get to that stage. Um, but right now, I think it's healthy that people put together this fund. Thank you for that. Anybody else with something to add? I agree with Wilma, like um, everything that she said, as long as we continue to make it uh, be loud about it and just really let everybody know what's still going on, as long as the problem is still there. Um, honestly, I feel like, you know, these companies, these really big companies, if they didn't speak out about it, there would definitely be issues. But I it does make sense that it's a good thing in general that they acknowledge that the problem is there, but it does feel performative at times where you don't know if they truly support the movement or they just don't want to be boycotted by you know these users of their products and such. Um, what Penn said earlier about you know all this Black Lives Matter like um, shirts and capitalism going on after these big events happened, I feel like um, just uh, as long as the, the group is able to, you know, feel like they feel some form of justice through their actions or feel that what they're doing is right for their community, I feel like there isn't necessarily a problem, but def definitely, making sure that these companies acknowledge that they're really at the top one percent and these black and brown communities these poc communities um are suffering i hope they continue to support us because we know that it's difficult to support ourselves thank you for that i saw danny you had unmuted before did you want to follow up yeah sure i think it's important for them to uh you know really um you know speak out on it as well, you know, using their uh, resources and privilege. And, uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just calling them out now, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that if they are profiting from it, you know, that, that at least some of the proceeds should go to, uh, uh, you know, uh, victims of families or organization that uh, truly support, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the community or, or those that uh, truly been harmed by it. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I you know want, 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 want to tell them you know to please you know consider that and 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 don't don't use this as an opportunistic you know just to 
uh, you know, get get uh, some type of wealth out of it, you know, but 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 truly, you know, use this opportunity to uh, and the resources that they have to support the community. Thank you for that, D uh, Patty. Did you? Yeah, I was going to say um, leverage our, uh, you know, our economic power. Uh, you know, how have we done that in the past? And you know, understand that we do have ec economic power, and you know, we can vote with our pocketbooks as well. And um, you know, we ought to leverage that for sure. Thank you. Thank you for all for that. I mean, it is again, as I said, I prefaced it. I was, yeah, this is something I think about quite often, especially working in the Bay Area where. You know, it's this liberal bastion, quote unquote, but you see uh, there's a lot of uh, conservative viewpoints or just oppressive things that happen um, intentionally or un un unintentionally. And so it's a matter of trying to dispel it each time, you know, and it's a dual edged sword. And of course, you want it, you want to see the support of these big name organizations, but you also want to see them do the work and make the changes and really create a better society. Um, we're winding down on time. We got about 15 minutes left. I wanted to open up this opportunity for doing something, um, a little intergenerational exchange is something I love doing. Um, Supervisor Wilma Chan, speaking to directly to Nicole, if there is something that you could tell her and people in her position based on your experiences um, in order to make their life a little better, what advice would you pass along? To make their lives a little better, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I would just really say don't, um, first of all, take care of yourself. Um, it's really important for you to take care of yourself um, in, in terms of your health and your, your I think family is really important, even as an elected official. I always, I hope I was always there for my kids and now I'm there for my grandkids. Um, I mean, you can do all these things, but if, if you don't take care of your own health and your own family, then um, you know, uh, I think it, in the end, at the end of the day, um, you're going to feel very sorry about that. I think the other thing I would say to you is um, don't get disappointed because it's not always going to work. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and you're going to be um, see a lot of people maybe who you thought you could rely on, who you can't rely on, or you had a plan and it didn't turn out the way you wanted to. It's it's always going to be like that. And for someone who's done it for a long time, I've been through a lot of that. And um, my advice there is, you know, don't take it personally. Um, just stick to your principles. Um, don't uh, let disappointment hold. You know, it's like when you fall off a horse, right? Get back on. Um, so um, just keep going. Um, you have people who support you. You have a cause that so important, I think you mentioned humanity. Um, for you, it was about being human and humanity. I mean, what could be better than that? Um, so I would just say, just know it's gonna be rocky road. <laughs> and there are good people in the world. Um, I think the thing that's kept me, some people ask me, how, how have you been able to stay in politics so long? And I don't think I'm naive, but I always think that there's, uh, there are a lot of good people out there. If I didn't think there were a lot of good people out there, I wouldn't be able to do this. I mean, why bother, right? Um, so just know there are a lot of good people out there, but there will be setbacks. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Definitely really good lifelong, you know, things to keep in mind. Definitely. I, I needed to hear that personally. So thank you. Uh, let's keep pouring into that cup. Uh, Patty, do you have anything to offer to uh, Nicole and people of her generation, if you will? Yeah, I, actually, I think it's really great that Supervisor Chan mentioned about taking care of yourself, uh, because uh, sometimes you can get so wrapped up in an issue um, and, and really, you know, run yourself down emotionally and mentally. So I think it's important to sort of uh, you know, sort of cadence your your energy level in you know into issues. Um, sometimes I wake up in the mornings and I and I think, why bother writing? Because you know the the climate change is happening, and you know in 50 years we won't even be around. You know, or or so many things are happening. You know, the last uh, administration, so many every day it was just I can't even watch the news. Um, and I think that there's just a lot of times when you just want to give up or you just think um, it, it's just too hard. It's like the myth of Sisyphus, you know, just pushing up that stone, you know, uh, up the mountain. But um, but then, you know, I, I see my kids, I see, you know, uh, you know, uh, leaders like Nicole stepping up and it just, you know, gives me a lot of hope that 
the young generation, you know, is going to step up just like they have, you know, had and, and Supervisor Chan talked about the 60s. Um, there's a lot of Filipino American, um, you know, leaders that, that I've come to know who were very active when they were in college and made some significant changes, you know, in San Francisco State, you know, in Cal, when it came to, um, you know, the studies that they were, um, you know, that, that they wanted to see in the curriculum. So I think that, you know, there are always pendulums that goes back and forth to, you know, things swinging back to, um, you know, oppression, to activism. And um, I just have to keep that in mind that, you know, if you look to history, you know, good overcomes the bad, bad comes up again, you can never be complacent and you never should be complacent when something, you know, when, when you have achieved a victory um, and just know history because it, you can't really know history and you can't really move forward until you really, uh, you know, study history and understand history. Thank you for that. It actually speaks to something I read recently by author Jeff Chang, uh, We Gonna Be All Right, where he talks about the pendulum swinging from justice to injustice. And it speaks to Supervisor Chan's point as well about the rocky road and needing perseverance. So thank you for that. Danny, uh, any sage advice to offer? <laughs> Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, this is kind of like passing the baton. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, definitely, like, you know, self care is really important, especially in, in this line of work, you know, yeah, really need to uh, find something that is uh, that will help center you and something that's enjoyable, you know, just to really uh, recharge and rejuvenate yourself. And uh, remember that, uh, you know, uh, this work or this fight uh, within itself, um, it's a marathon. So take your time, you know, you have to pace yourself. And also, so, uh, just like uh, everyone else say, you know, look back to history, you know, I mean, what's great about it is that, you know, we have a wealth of history and we have a wealth of knowledge and, uh, you know, that definitely that you and, and, and the younger generation can glean from as well and learn from our mistakes or try to avoid making the same mistake that we made. But even if you did, you know, it's okay, you know, because, you know, in life, uh, you, you learn as uh, you live, as you learn, you learn as you live. So definitely, you know, I mean, don't be, don't be afraid to uh, make that mistake. And yeah, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, continue organizing and I'm, I'm inspired, you know, just by your age, you know, you're doing the work because I wish that I was doing the work at your age, you know, I, I would probably be, you know, <laughs> doing, I'm doing great right now, I guess, or, or maybe not, you know, because I, I met older organizers that still, you know, in the space and still, you know, <laughs> fighting. <laughs> But definitely, you know, I, I want to say that I'm I'm really inspired by you know just just the work that you're doing at such a young age. It's it's really great. Thank you so much. Like honestly, this is my first panel uh, speaking. Like I haven't really had experience with this. I was honestly very nervous when I first decided to join. But I also like really want to. I'm really inspired by this. Like this is a movement that I really care about. So I want to be able to use my voice as such such a young age and you know really talk to you all like you all are so knowledgeable and I feel like I'm genuinely learning so much from being here and just talking about this with, with you all so thank you for that thank you for that but wait you're not off the hook that easy because you have an expertise you have wisdom as well and you have our ear and so I'm wondering what would you turn on the tables tell your elders your olders people who have uh a couple more years experience you know um maybe just as a youth right now and having experience with adults or like my parents just always keep in mind that things are changing and you might not always be caught up with it like um definitely understandable and <laughs> a lot of youth would understand like oh my parents wouldn't understand that or stuff like that just always know that things are definitely changing. Things might not always be the same as, you know, a few years back. And just always be mindful and open-minded about the things that youth are going through. Definitely, thank you, Wilma and Patty, for telling me to keep my mental space, you know, open and like really focusing on my mental health. Like I know like a lot of other teenagers are suffering with mental health and just things like that. Just uh, be open-minded. That's what I would say to you all. Great advice. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Nicole. Um, 
we're coming up on about five, seven minutes left. And I'm wondering, um, is there anything that you all would want to see change? Just walk away from this conversation, just kind of last thoughts. And I'll start with you, Supervisor Chan, just any last thoughts? I just think this was a great dialogue and we should have more uh, forums like this. Um, I think um, talking about stuff um, with people um, like people, but people with slightly different backgrounds and different points of view um, is always enriching and will always lead us in a good direction. I think we can't just, um, I know none of us here do that, but you can't just sit, sit at home and be upset about it and, and stew. I think it's really sad that um, a lot of the older um, Asians won't even go outside now. I think that's really, really terrible. Um, I understand why, you know, because um, I think it's really cowardly when when 85 year olds and 90 year olds are being pushed to the ground for nothing. I mean, they're not being robbed nothing. There's no reason except for hate. And um, it, it might be good for us to, um, to go um, into some of their settings, whether they're um, uh, old age homes or whatever, and have some conversations with them. It might help them. So yeah, I, th I think it's great more talks like this among different types of um, populations. Station going. I support the uh, Patty. You unmuted. Yeah, um, I'll I'll try and you know, keep it brief. But um, there was an ins uh, an incident that happened when my daughter and I were walking our our dog one afternoon, and this was maybe six weeks ago when you know a lot of anti-Asian violence um, started to be reported. And we were crossing the street uh, and the, a van had stopped to let us cross the street. When we got to the other side, the woman driving the van had rolled down a window and she asked us if we were Asian. And so I didn't think anything of it. And I was about to say yes. And my daughter said yes. Um, and then she you know, said that she supported us. And um, uh, I, forgetting some of the things that she said, um, I didn't really hear her that well. And so you know, then we said, you know, thank you. You, she drove off. My daughter and I continued walking, and my daughter was was nervous, and she said, "I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said yes that that we're Asian because she thought that something was going to happen to us." And it really made me think about, you know, just the impact that it has on her because she's on social media, she's reading about, you know, all these things and seeing, um, you know, pictures of of these, um, you know, the victims. And, um, and I told her, I said, no, it was perfectly fine. And I asked her, you know, some of the other things that she had said. And she had, this woman in the van had said things like, um, um, you know, I know Asian people and you're all, you know, really, really nice. And um, there were a couple of, you know, stereotypes that she had said. And, um, and I had posted it on my Facebook account. So we had this really good dialogue, I think, with my friends. And, um, you know, some friends were saying, wow, I can't believe, you know, she said that, that was like not okay. And I said, you know, her heart was in the right place and that's where I'm taking it. And, um, you know, she made the effort to reach out and say, you know, I'm sorry, this is happening to you. So I wanted to take that to heart that, you know, that that she was reaching out um, and, and, you know, being kind of in community with me. Um, but also, you know, just seeing the impact that it was having on my daughter and, you know, having to talk her through and saying, you don't have to worry if I'm going on BART to go into the city to get a haircut, you know, you don't have to accompany me, um, you know, the way that she had said that, but it really made me realize that this is, you know, impacting, um, you know, a lot of people. And I think it's just talking about it, you know, really talking about it and, and understanding a lot of different points of view is really important as well, so that you're not just you know, dismissing this woman who was trying to reach out um, and, you know, her heart was in the right place. And I think it's just trying to be really open-minded about a lot of things that are happening today. Thank you for that. And that's a great example, a real life example of something, that, like you said, her heart in the right place and taking it uh, in stride and realizing that this is a part of a larger conversation and more conversations to come. Um, Danny, any closing thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, just having this dialogue within itself is really great. And uh, I think that uh, just by uh, seeing uh, how many folks that showed up, I mean, uh, folks are really, uh, you know, are, are here to uh, really listen. And and, and, and I think that, uh, you know, just uh, really being there and supporting each other, uh, just like I had mentioned before, you know, just kind of like really showing up for each other. And also, you know, you can also learn learn a little bit more about uh, de-escalation tactic and so forth, you know, which would uh, 
uh, be more like restorative, you know, in supporting community instead of uh, punitive. And, um, you know, a lot of the information, of course, you know, you could get from uh, Asian American Advancing Justice or, or many other organization, you know, that will offer this. And, and, and of course, you know, I mean, just uh, seeing your neighbor, you know, I mean, just, um, you know, checking in with your neighbor, uh, seeing how they're doing, offering any, any type of support. And of course, you know, just learning from each other, you know, just, um, just uh, you know, just sharing stories, you know, just getting to know each other. I, I, I think that's really important within itself. And, and, and I think that, you know, I hope that's the message that, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking here, you know, was to really connect and get to know each other. We hear you loud and clear. Thank you for that. And thank you for saying restorative justice by name. And that's something that I've written about is actually the subject matter of my most recent podcast is about how restorative justice is something that you can apply in the classroom, in relationships, in community. Um, so thank you for that. Nicole, closing thoughts. My closing thoughts are that these discussions are really important for our community. And I'm really glad that I got to be here with you all today. And I'm I hope that there are more like these in the future where we get the chance to really outreach to others, to peers, to youth, to, you know, people who don't know much on the situation. I know like a lot of people still aren't really as in touch with the things that are happening in our community right now. So I feel like these are really important to really make a change for us right now. Thank you, Thank you all for that. My closing thought is there. Continue to talk, continue to tell your story and continue to listen really important to listen. Um, and we're going to end on a slide that has some resources for people who look to get involved, make donations, or just know about organizations on the ground doing the work. I wanted to share a couple of organizations that I've been following is uh, Asians for Black Lives, um, the Trust Your Struggle Collective, Courage, which is spelled C-U-R-Y-J, um, Civic Design Studio, and Good Eats. Uh, the last couple of organizations I mentioned have come together to create murals that are now in the windows of Old Oakland on, near 13th Street. Um, be sure to get out, soak in some of that energy and be in community with people. And that's the way that we're going to get out of this together. Again, my name is Pendarvis Harshaw. I'm a journalist with KQED and I host a podcast called Right Nowish. I want to thank Lisa Harris and the entire Alameda County uh, library team. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice.